Good morrow to you, sir, and welcome to the Glassworks Music Podcast. In the studio in the present day, we have Karen van der Hoven. Hey, nonny, nonny. And Charlie Farragut. You're right. The topic of today's podcast is, of course, Shakespeare. So, Miss, would you uh, like to introduce yourself to the people listening? Hello, my name is Miss. Um, I'm the uh, head of performing arts faculty. And at the Glassworks. At the place. Glassworks, yes. And I teach um, drama. Yeah. Uh, down at the Glassworks. So, how did your journey into the performing arts and theatre begin? I've always um, kind of enjoyed uh, uh, drama. When yeah. I actually, what it was, what really first started it was, I remember having a sick day um, and watching Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, that's a brilliant. That's one of Shakespeare's. Yeah, plays. that's one of Shakespeare's plays, and seeing um, Phil Daniels. Um, I think he was on EastEnders, and he, he's this guy, and he's got a Cockney accent, All right. and um, and he was he played Puck, um, uh, and he was just amazing, and I mm. just thought if because he had this because he wasn't conventional and because he didn't sound like everybody else. Um, you know, because he wasn't really, really posh, mm. and um, and because he did have this Cockney accent and and this like kind of normal accent, he got you into it. He ca- yeah, yeah, he really got me. He really got me into it, and, and I just thought, well, because he sounds like me, because he sounds normal, well then I can I can do it, and I he, I really got into it then, um, and I really understood it. I really started understanding. How old was you when when this happened? Uh, I must have been about uh, twelve. Um, I saw it on, on TV. So and what, then, what sort of year are we talking here? Uh, oh, at least the 1800s. <laughs> you cheeky bugger. Um, so just sort of to give a time frame of, of how many years experience you have oh, in, in performing arts. Oh, so, well, I've been teaching for about 15 years. Wow, okay. um, yeah, so before before teaching, um, I one of the things that I used to do was um, I... Uh, co-run a um, community theatre company mm-hmm. and we put we were called Drama Queens and we put some community theatre on it de- down at the um, Lower Lees Amphitheatre and yep. uh, we put some theatre down at the Lower Lees Amphitheatre and we did uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and Twelfth Night and uh, it was beautiful actually right. to, to have some um, theatre going on down there and I actually I actually acted down there so you've done a bit of acting as well in down the, there yeah, yeah absolutely mm. i played wall Did you, have you ever so in, in like okay so you, you obviously you teach performing arts yes. and drama you also act as well is that is that on the rare on the rare occasion yeah um i did i i have done yeah i do really love it um and i um yes and i do act as uh, as well i don't act as mm. often I mean, um, it's uh, it's quite an interesting thing because obviously you can't just get on stage and and read out lines. You see people at the pantomime, yeah. and they're acting for the main cast. Will probably acting for about two hours. They've got to remember each and every line and yeah. not mess up. Yeah. How how do they do that? Um, well, it takes uh, practice. It takes a lot of dedication. It takes professionalism. Yeah. Um, yeah, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of a pe- you know people can be born with the ability of just remembering lines, but also it takes uh, a lot of dedication. Some people are born with that mm. skill of remembering, um, but some people also work very hard at it. You know, um, some people you know so people can have that ability, but then some people can also develop the ability. Yeah. Um, nobody, you know, uh, you can either be born with it or you can work. Um, to get it so yeah. you know uh, it's it's something that people can work towards as well so something it's open I've, to everybody what something I've learned from you about you teaching me mm. for drama is that if you don't remember the line but you remember like a paraphrase of it so a summary of it mm-hmm. you can say the line and if it isn't perfect but it's along the lines of what it is, and the person who has the line next and can carry on, the audience will have no idea. Well, that, that's the whole thing. Like that's where improv sort of originated from. People who mess up a lot, I'm guessing. Yeah. Went on to improvise, and there's like 
I know in America it's quite big. People go to improv yeah. classes and, and whatever happens, you just go with it. Yeah, I mean, the only problem with um, with that is that as long as the person uh, that you've got really tight company, so they know, the next person knows, um, knows their, their cue. And, and as long as you know um, where you're going to, so as long as, as everybody knows their cues, um, that works. So, yeah. yeah, you've got to know the story. Um, and everybody's got to be, re- you know, you've got to have some sort of pro- professional relationship. So yeah. everybody's got to know where they're going to, um, and that takes that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of trust. Um, you've got time. to know, yeah, lots of yeah, time. Lots of time. Um, yeah, um, and it's you know that's a real skill. It's a real, it's it's what we call transferable skills, and that's what you learn within drama. Um, these are these are huge life skills that drama teaches you. Which is why I think it's so important. I'm going to go a bit yeah, that's fine. teachery here. It's why that drama is so and performing arts are so important because they teach you things like teamwork, um, dedication, caring on you know um, how to work with people um, because mm. it's all about that trust um, and being able to work with people. Um, so teamwork is a big part of your lessons, like in performing arts. I know yeah, it's, yeah. It's a big part of music as well. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to, to depend on other people and being dependable is it's really important. Don't you think so, Charlie? The well, yeah, the trust in groups yeah. means a lot. I mean, because there could be one time where someone doesn't turn up. Yeah. And it could be that it could be, only, fatal to the it, it could be the only topic. one time you have left. Say you've got two days until performance. We've gotten to the point of marking our scripts for the bits we don't know. And if we've got two days until the performance and we're doing a bit that one person doesn't know and that one person doesn't turn up, then... It affects the whole group. It affects the whole group because we're sitting there. We'll either have to change the plan or just wait. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's another thing it teaches you. You have to be flexible. You have to be adaptable. You have to be able to yeah. think on your feet, you know. Um yeah, so it does. You you know you you have to be to you have to be professional. Um, what what are you currently working on? So and uh, you as well, Charlie. So Charlie, uh, Charlie and I are working on the play that goes wrong, which is a farce. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you so you have to be very professional because you have to be um, working very hard at looking making something look Funny. like it's going wrong but it has to um go right yeah yeah it has to, for it to go right it has to look like it's going wrong um so you have to to so fast is when uh, the characters uh um rush around in lots mm. of different directions and lots of silly things happen it's quite hard though because i mean the professionalism in it mm. it's quite hard not to laugh when <laughs> one of your one of the other people, I mean, there's a scene in it where someone shoots a Wallace and Gromit dog, <laughs> which, is a, which is a teddy, <laughs> and then someone walks in, runs in and trips over the dog, but we can't laugh at that. No, that's called corpsing. But the, yeah. audi- the yeah. audience can, so it's really hard for us not to laugh. Yeah. I remember on um, BBC One or BBC Two a few uh, years ago, or it might have been this year, I can't remember, there was a, a, a live play of Peter Pan. Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. the, it's yeah, the that's same, same company. company. It's the same company. Same yeah. Company, is that? Yeah. So they've done a lot of things. So they've done um, a bank robbery that goes wrong, um, the play that goes wrong, and other things I can't remember. But we're also doing King Lear. Um, and is that Shakespeare? That is Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. Shakespeare. I'm not. You. You're, you yeah, are. You yeah, are. Yeah, <laughs> I am. Uh, and um, and I've got. Ellie uh, Mia. and Mia, they're doing something about teenagers and how uh, how they're perceived by um, the older generation. Yeah. Um, that's a really good piece. And um, the Year 13s are doing something on, um, they're doing sort of extracts from sort of uh, seminal pieces. Right. Could you, when they're doing Metamorphosis, when I walked in, yes, a one of the, days ago. one of which is Metamorphosis, and we've just all been to see Metamorphosis by Splendid Productions. 
Is, is that a film or, or a play? It's or? a play. It's a play. It's a play. quite a weird play. Um, yeah. Basically, someone turns into a bug, as Metamorphosis is. That's but just... It's, yeah. it's kind of yeah. reverse, though, because Metamorphosis, I've, I view that more as the changing of something hideous and ugly to something... Like a caterpillar into a butterfly or yeah. something. Yeah, but then uh, it's this bloke who has a... Well, you could say a fairly decent life. He was He's been pushed around quite a bit because... I mean, you're you're looking at me like that. Oh no, I'm like, just interested. Cu- curious, right? So this is another thing about drama, yeah. and also about <laughs> the theatre um, course, which is that you're allowed to have your own opinions, and and it's all about exactly, discussion. Yeah. That's important. And that, so I was looking at him because I'm interested in his well, opinion. And, he had and quite a high up job in the army. Yeah, quite really high up job in the army, and then. His dad retired and kind of forced no, his him. No, da- his dad. His dad got sick, so because of that, he had to. He like so. Um, Gregor was. Dep- they were the whole family were depending on him just to get all the money. So he had to get. It's not. And you said army. Does that link in with your interest in joining the RAF? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> let's I mean, let's keep well, it on it, subject it here, Ben. Links, <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. But I mean, I'm not gonna. Let someone stop me doing what I want to do exactly if true. they need need to be dependent on the family, which I hopefully won't have to be. Really? So, so if 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 you weren't in the same situation, if you were in a similar situation, uh, I think I'd probably make more money in the RF than sitting in an office okay. as a salesman. Um, this isn't a question yeah, off okay. of the sheet, but this is one that I'd be interested in knowing. Okay. Do you think plays and like Shakespeare yeah. um, adaptations that are adapted into movies do you yeah. think they sort of do they help the performing arts industry or do you think they hinder it if if so if a, if a play is yeah. transformed into a live movie yeah like, i think they can only help um i think right. they can only help if you look at if you look if you look at say for example um yeah i think if you look at recent um like Romeo and Juliet, that's yeah. how, like with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, if you look at recent adaptations, they brought um, Shakespeare to a new um, audience. Yeah. You, the problem is with stuff like that, I mean, I know you'll be one for this, is I have a really bad habit of getting annoyed at films after I've read the book. Mm. And I know you, as a drama teacher, you would have done the play itself. Mm. They'll make a film of it and cut like twenty percent out of it, and you would be getting frustrated at certain scenes that they've cut out, which you think are quite important. Uh, no, I don't really care, um, because let me tell you why. If it's a good film, and if somebody gets something out of it, then. That's that's fine with me. If somebody thinks, uh, if if you've got um, a year ten student who thinks, do you know what? I really like that, mm. and uh, that's going to make me sit in my lesson, and I'm actually a bit more interested in this now. Then that's better. Mm. Surely that's better. Uh, thing for me is um, thing for me is with. Uh, movies that have been adapted from Shakespeare plays is that some of them don't keep the the Shakespearean sort of language so they 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 they, they use modern English mm. instead of old English what do you think of that I like that as well, I, well I'm not a purist it's the I same. think I think you can adapt it for your time I yeah. think that um it's there was a recent um adaptation of Midsummer Night's Dream that I went to see where there was a um, two where where you have the so you have the four lovers um, that were, that go into the um, forest um, and you've got so you have two sets and one set was you know a typical girl and a boy yeah. and one set was two boys and there was you know that was awfulness, and there was an American um, uh, man and a woman, a member of the audience, who sat like who's standing behind us in the groundlings. The groundlings are the audience who are in the pit, 
Um, yeah. and, they're, and they're called that because obviously they're in in the ground. The yeah, in, commoners. Yeah, the, the, com- the yeah, they're the commoners. Well, not, not even the commoners in shape of time. They would have been like the low of the low. Well, yeah, they the would commoners have, would have at would least. Have, yeah, <laughs> they would have paid like paid a penny to go in, and and uh, yeah, so they would have they would have gone in. Anyway, wait, so these these Americans were so cross about the fact that this had been adapted like that, um, but it was fantastic. I thought it was fantastic. And the kids th- from here that I had taken thought it was brilliant that yeah. it, it had been updated and adapted um, because it made it more relevant and it made it alive for the 21st century. Yeah. Um, I suppose there's different ways to look at it. One way to look at it is that it is a hindrance and that you should stick to the old traditional style of, of the way Shakespeare wrote it. But also the new generations of people in the 21st century that mm. we are now wouldn't understand old English, and and it's better to modernise it yeah. so people understand it now. Yeah. I, well, my so my thing is is you got something that was written in the 1600s. Yeah. Okay. And and if we want to keep them, if we want to keep it going, and we want to keep everything, uh, keep it still going, then we have to recognise that uh, things have got to be fresh and and, yeah, and, and, exciting. and exciting. Now, the themes in themselves will always be fresh because they are they, they are things that we recognise, things like love and death mm. and betrayal, things that are current, things that um, are day-to-day, things that we feel as humans on an everyday, day-to-day event, you know, things that we struggle with as human beings. So th- there are always going to be things that we recognise. But as stories, we can retell the, these things in in ways that, that we see fit because we we are free to tell them and retell them as 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 we want. It's up to us. We we can yeah. we can we can tell them in the way that we want to. And um, so we can tell them in the bustle. We can we can tell them um, in togas. We can tell them in um, uh, you know uh, chinos we, and and whatever. We can we can update them as much as we want to. Um, that's up to us. Yeah, I mean, five hundred years it's been since Shakespeare wrote these plays, and I think it's quite incredible how they've how the stories of. I don't know how many plays he wrote. Probably about twenty-five, I'm guessing. Maybe, maybe more. Right. So he wrote. And they've remained intact in that time. Th- no, he wrote thirty-nine plays, four narrative poems. He wrote the sonnets and other poetry. Mm. Mm. See, I think with um, like adaptations of these plays. So earlier we did mention the most recent one of Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio, and. Yeah, I I didn't really enjoy that play as much, that as much as the older ones. But they did still keep some of the themes in it of iambic pentameter and mm. the proper storyline of it. It was just modernised mm. to appeal to a more younger audience at the world they see today, instead of mm. how it. Well, I don't want to say how it was back then, because that's still how it was in that film, like earlier on in the nineties, which I believe is kind of where where they've tried to set it. But they have still kept the theme of Romeo and Juliet in it. Yeah, but they, I mean, what I mean is those overarching themes, the themes of love, you know, yeah. the themes of betrayal. Those themes, those themes will never. You know, those themes are always going to be prevalent in They're part of part of everyday life. Of every of everybody's love of life, yeah. So, um, the next question is: mm. Do you use Shakespeare in your lessons, Miss Van Oven? Yes, um, we. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we do use Shakespeare in in um, our lessons, and I'll quote Shakespeare quite a lot. A lot. A lot. <laughs> Um, not everybody gets it, but yes, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's always a good Shakespearean quote, which is on easy is the head that wears the crown. Yeah. I like that. Um, uh, there is one word of Shakespeare's that I do like. What's and that? He invented this word. It's a, a 
soliloquy. Yes, soliloquy is a good one. Yeah, there are. I mean, Shakespeare in- invented lots of words mm. and lots of uh, things that people don't know. Um, you know, and yeah, he's brilliant. Right. He or she. I mean, there's lots of there's yeah. lots of um, controversy about um, who Shakespeare was. Obviously, I don't know if whether or not you covered that in your questions but you know there was lots of uh, yeah. discussion about who Shakespeare was or whether or not Shakespeare was an actual real person or whether or not Shakespeare was a, a publishing company I think we'll, we'll sort of cover what I'm about to say a bit okay. later but um, the equivalent of uh, so peop- when people are annoyed at someone like quite commonly people will put up their middle finger Yeah. but back then it was uh, uh, the, the, bite- the, biting. The, the biting of the thumb yeah which well, is, uh, is a sort of which someone does that it's to not prove really cowardice yeah. wasn't I mean, that I mean now that's not really considered it's not even rude now no. but back then it was really yeah nowadays it's like wh- wh- why are you, why are you biting your thumb <laughs> <laughs> back, back then it's the do you bite your thumb at me sir yes <laughs> I yes. do I do bite my thumb but I'm not at you sir oh Charlie that's fantastic well I did Romeo and Juliet for GCSE yeah. well so. <laughs> Uh, but back then, that's the people put up the middle finger or stick out the tongue at people. Yeah. Back then, I mean, what what we do now, it yeah. wouldn't be rude then, and vice versa, which is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think sticking out your tongue would be would have been rude then, actually. Well, yeah. Um. Yeah. But, but you stick your middle finger up at someone back then, they'd be like, okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> back to you too, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's times have changed. Things yeah, things have changed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, would you be able to give us the shortened version of the history of Shakespeare? Uh, <laughs> he, he didn't have the best upbringing, did he? he? Well, no, he was he had he had a very kind of normal upbringing, really. Um, his dad was a glove maker. Um, he went to a like fairly normal little grammar school. Didn't he? What did he have a job as a? Like a labeler or something here to stick labels on bottles. Oh, I don't think so. But um, he was yeah. born in Stratford upon Avon in 1564. At the age of 18, he married Anne Hathaway, who had three children. Shakespeare that then moved to London, apparently leaving his family behind. Mm. Very nice. Mm. Um, he worked in London theatres during. 1590 as a writer, actor and co-manager of companies and actors and of a theatre building. We don't really know that much about him. That's quite interesting because he's so famous now mm. that he, I guess he wouldn't have been back then but as much. We just, said, we just don't know that much about him. But the strange thing was, I mean, he was always trying to improve what he was doing. He moved yeah. mm. his entire theatre across, well, across London. Yeah. He he had it dismantled, piece by piece, moved, and rebuilt because it was in a less prominent area. It was in quite a deprived area, and the rich didn't really want to. Oh, but I think people used to do that quite a bit, actually. So, what building a prominent area and then? Well, it's a bit like it's a more extreme version of setting up a tent and then taking the tent down again. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Shakespeare earned enough money at this time to buy the second largest house in Stratford, a new place. Um, his wife and children moved there in ni- 1597. From there until his death in 1660, Shakespeare spent more time in Stratford, although he still wrote plays f- which were performed in London. I do believe there was one play that he was writing... When he died. Hmm. I think I've read somewhere that there was a play he was writing when he died and it never got finished. There's probably several plays that he started writing but never finished because he obviously died in, in his mid-50s. So That was that was old for then. Yeah, back then. It was a good age to live to. I mean, mm. people have older. I think he died on his birthday, didn't he? Yeah, that's, that's quite depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> quite well, never. Amazing. it's never a good day to die, darling. So, Miss Miss Van Hoven. Yes. What is the most influential play of Shakespeare in your opinion? Oh God. Out of thirty nine, that's quite difficult. Yeah, play. I don't know. Influential. Well, which is well, well, the most influential for you? Maybe your favourite, or the one that you you take quotes from the most? And 
people talk about well them. i don't know for me oh i don't know the one i love is midsummer night's dream yeah but that's that's always been my favorite but um that's just a personal family favorite um uh it's difficult it yeah. is really difficult um but then you know then i love at the moment i i, I read i'm really enjoying king lear but that's because at the moment you're working on i'm it. working on king lear yeah. so yeah we did um titus andronicus um last year um with year 13 and that was i've never done that before uh, and that's really gruesome and bloody mm, and a bit like Macbeth then yeah well in titus andronicus i mean that's really that, that that's really that was a really gruesome bloody one that was um i think that was one of his first ones mm. and in that um uh what happens is um i'm trying to remember the name of the woman i can't remember the name but uh, a woman uh feeds titus um her sons no titus feeds a, a, um titus feeds her sons a woman's sons to her in a pie jeez like yeah. they cook that's a bit like Hansel and Gretel. Yes, right. Hang on a second. So, yes, it is very much <laughs> like. So, Titus's daughter is raped and her arms and tongue are cut out. Jesus. Yeah. And... And they, they were writing about that then. Yes. He was writing. Because, it, because it was a, it's a Roman play. So, he but, nicked well, a lot of stuff was that from... Was that considered okay then? Or, uh, yes, or? because it's gruesome. So, if you think about it... So, it, if you think about it, um, they didn't... There was... A, he wanted to do a lot of stuff that appealed to low-brow audience, audiences as well as a lot of high-brow audiences. So, really, some of it was yeah. propaganda and some of it, you know, some of it... Um, so, appealing to the... Um, the um the very rich people who came but some of it was a bit like a pantomime obviously um, they, they if someone was to uh, write about uh you said rape and yeah and, and feeding people in pie that would not be considered okay it's amazing how society has changed because a lot of what shakespeare wrote back then yeah. wouldn't be deemed appropriate today in any way no but the, i mean it's been on it was on at the globe no. and it's it was you know shakespeare's bloodiest play and there was like masses loads of, of blood used when it was performed at the globe and i think there were people fainting is mm. in the audience so, you mean yes in the audience so um Mac macbeth for me is quite oh um, yeah macbeth is huge isn't it that's probably my favorite either that or uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, I think Hamlet. Well, Hamlet to be Hamlet's or not really to be. Good. I, I really Whether like Hamlet. Whether it is Hamlet. nobler in the mind to suffer the singings <laughs> and yeah. arrows of outrageous fortune. Yes. Because in the end of Hamlet, there's no there's no heirs for the throne because they're all dead. No, but because um, the other blokey takes the heir, takes the throne, doesn't he? Because Hamlet kills. Um, can't remember his name now. <laughs> <laughs> huh. It's been a quite long time since I read it. <laughs> Yeah, but the, the guy who turns up from Diddly Doo Doo. This, yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to the uh, second, the, to the penultimate question now. Yes, okay. Miss Van Hoven, what would you say to people who want to pursue a career in performing arts? That you should only do it if um, it's a burning desire. Because so if you have a real passion for yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a business. Hmm. And it's Much a, like the music industry. Yeah. It's difficult to get into. It's really difficult to get into. It's really hard in, in this sort of economic time. There's not very much money in it. So um, if it's something that you love doing and if it's something that you have to do yeah. because um, it, it's inside of you and um, it's what you need to do um, because it's what you need to do to express yourself. 
I um, mean, yeah, that's the whole point of acting. You, yeah, you have to display emotion to the audience. Like music. Yeah, but but I don't mean to express yourself. But what I mean by that is, it's something that you lit is literally bursting out of you. Yeah. You have to do it. Um, uh, so, so don't do it if it's a well. I could do this, or I could go and be a businessman. If it's if it's a choice, don't do it. Don't. Possibly. If you have a choice, then then go and choose to be something else. If it is literally, I have no other choice. My soul won't rest unless I am on the stage. Yeah. Then then do it. I mean, there are people uh, that sorry, there are famous actors who are deemed Shakespearean actors for mm. me um, my favourite is Patrick Stewart yes he played Picard in Star Trek yeah. Professor X in the X-Men he didn't come to acting until late yeah and you've, you've got other people uh, Sir Michael Caine yeah um, Ian McKellen Ian McKellen yeah he's very good yeah. I'll tell you who else is um, really good um, oh his name's just gone from me Kenneth Branagh Mm -hmm. Kenneth Branagh is worth watching. He's amazing, and he uh, he brings Shakespeare to life. Um, he he uh, has he's done some really fantastic work. Um, he's really good in Hamlet, um, and um, he did um, uh, much ado about nothing. Oh, that's a brilliant one, isn't it? Yes, uh, I haven't seen it all the way through, but I've heard about yeah, it. Yeah, it's really, really good. And he d he did a performance of um, Winter's Tale, which was also really, really good as well. Really, really good. He he just has a really great understanding of Shakespeare. I think for the final question of this interview, mm -hmm. for the main part, what's next for you? For where me, you, where, I mean, mm, obviously, okay, you, you're how world far domination, in, of course. <laughs> how far into your career would you say you are? Oh, I don't know. I'm really happy um, where I am. I think it's a really important job. Do you see yourself teaching in 10 years? Where do you, okay, yeah. if we say 10 years down the line, where do you see yourself? Um, completely uh, dominating the world through drama. That, that's a good, uh, that's a confident attitude to have, yeah. I think, I mean, for anyone. Out really. of all the Shakespeare plays, because there's a lot of a lot of characters which resemble different people mm -hmm. so what would you most compare yourself to what character Ooh, oh my god that's an, um, that's such a good question that's a really good question because sometimes you could be compared to like Puck from Midsummer Night's yeah. Dream because you're quite insane yeah <laughs> not know. in the fact that's that you're a half donkey half whatever what well, you think I'm, I'm <laughs> bottom <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I think that's such a great question. I don't know. So I could do music festivals, and then you, while you think of, let me that. think about that. Yeah. Okay. okay. You do that, and I'll have a think about it. That's probably the toughest question we've had on the podcast. <laughs> that far. is, su Charlie. That's Thus an amazing far. question. I might have to pass you for the on the course just for that. That's that's inspired. Ooh, that's cool. Well done. Um. So, Ooh, music okay. festivals. Okay. So we'll update you on where we are. Um, in the music festivals two weeks ago we looked at Reading the week yep. before that we looked at Glastonbury this week uh, the magnificent Miss Van Oven has chosen the letter K and the number what was it two? yep so K2 so K2 K something interesting about K2 it's a mountain in, in um, Nepal <laughs> <laughs> so by K2 we meant she selects a letter and there was um, two options two options glossary. This I'm not really sure how to pronounce. I think it's Kemworth. So... Nebworth. It might be Nebworth. Is it Nebworth? Yes, it's Nebworth. That's what's a sign of K. Like I knew that. Um, so Nebworth, I've never even heard of that. Neither, neither have I. I'll we'll have to... It's going to be an interesting one. It is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, they do music things there. So, so from what I've uh, gathered here, Nebworth is a village in England. So... I'm guessing it's quite. A, it's a bit of a smaller festival, but it's made it into the book. Yep. It's it's in Hertfordshire, which is where I originate from, and it's south of Stevenage, which is quite close to where I was born, actually. Uh, let's have a look. So it is a three-day affair. It it's a recurring open air rock and pop concert. Yeah. Held on the grounds of the Nebworth 
Nebworth House in Nebworth. <laughs> and I wouldn't have guessed. When did it start, Charlie? Um, let's have a look. I'm not really sure, but it does say... Uh, it says here it, it first occurred in 1974. 1974. When the, the Allman Brothers Band, which they're famous for doing the uh, the Top Gear theme, with uh, Jess, Jess, Jessica, and the Doobie Brothers and other artists attracted a 60,000 audience number. It's quite a, quite a big audience for the first festival. Yeah, it's a good... It's a good Do better than Glastonbury, put it that way. Sorry there, Michael. Um, don't take any offence to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, once again, just going to summarise it. Um, so, it is an ancestral home, dating back as far as the Doomsday Book. Okay. <laughs> Practically inventing the moshing magic mushroom flying bottles of, excuse my French, piss. Because, of course, <laughs> at a music festival, when you're in the crowd, you don't really want to go to the toilet in a portal local you'll lose your place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Lovely. So, there are bands up there. Led Zeppelin. A brilliant band. Don't really listen to them. Queen. Love them. Brilliant band again. But from what I've got so far, it's quite it's a successful festival. Yeah. Um, Cliff Richard played there. Another brilliant artist. Um, Oasis. Oh, Oasis have been there as well. And they've got some quite. They got two. Yeah. Gi- they got two gigs on um. The uh, over the one weekend over the um, one weekend it is um yeah. it's held. And more than twenty five thousand people witnessed Nolan Co. After an incredible three million people. Three million people apply for tickets for this festival. Is that the first one, or was that last year's all? Um, was that? Well, it's only goes to 2009. Wait, um, so, it's a, is it a finished festival? Is it still going? Or um, is there anything on the Google page there? Yeah, we can have a look on Google. What, Nebworth? Yeah. I think it's still going. Yeah, this. so the Nebworth Festival comprises concerts at the famous Nebworth House. So the major concerts, it says it starts here in 1976. All the way through till two thousand nine, yeah. So I, I guess they, they stopped. Uh, the the um the what latest is one here is on? it's two thousand four. Um, I'm going off Wikipedia here. So it probably hasn't week, been so. updated since two thousand and fourteen. Yeah, fifty fifty thousand people attended the one two thousand fourteen. That was the, that was the so- sonosphere. I'm not wearing my glasses today. In two thousand fourteen, big names that appeared. Then were Metallica, Iron Maiden, yep. The Prodigy, Dream, Dream Theater, Slayer, Alice in Chains. Oh, I like them. And, and Ch- Wait, Frank Tyner and, Frank Tyner and Rat- Rattlesnakes is a good yeah. group. Um, a group that I often listen to. I mean, obviously, next week is our last uh, episode. In, yeah, in so the I seven, might in the seven series. So what? What will we? I might try and cram two music festivals in. Okay. Um, there's another one which I do want to go and see is a festival which isn't completely revolved around music called Burning Man which is held in the Black Rock Desert where's the Black Rock Desert what country that is, is in that America in Nirvana and um loads of people who have been to America and <laughs> and yeah, loads especially of people have been to America. especially Nevada yeah. um will know that the biggest place you'll ever go to there is possibly Las Vegas because it is dead out there, hence Death Valley. Um, Death, so Death, Death Valley is a very dangerous place. To go. It is it's a so very hot, dangerous place. We've driven through there. It rains like maybe two millimeters per we, year. We drove through there You've on been my through the Death Valley. Um, we went on an America road trip. You drove through been, there. That's incredible, Charlie. Because um, it is a dead straight road. I mean, it's all like speed checks by aircraft out in America, but mm. because of the, there is an airstrip out there, but the police don't care about the speed you do out there because a, no one's just gonna casually drive through Death Valley, so it's mm. a dead straight road. And do you need to get permission to go through it? Or no, you can just drive through it because it's it is it is the only way you can get into Vegas, unless you go out the other side, which is a different different desert not sure what that one was but 
because we couldn't get through there in a day, we had to stop. Right. And halfway through, there is a tiny, tiny stream. Like, if you were to... Like the River Stour in Ashford? No, not even that. Really? It was like it's like a it's like a spring, like a, just a trickle of water, which is constant because uh, it's um. How close is it to the sea? Well, it's landlocked. It's it all runs from the um river, which is held up by the river dam, by the uh Hoover Dam. I'm not sure what the river's called. I can't remember. Bit, oh no, that's a bit further in. Isn't it? Um, but Burning Man is quite a big festival. Um, seven days in 120 degree heat. Is that fa- that's Fahrenheit? I'm, I'm guessing it? that's Fahrenheit because for uh, British people, I mean, go you'll go to take a sip of water and it'll probably evaporate before it hits your mouth. Um, 100, so 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius. You're looking at like. probably a good 70 degrees. Maths isn't my strong point. I think it's about 70. That's 48 degrees. So that's almost 50 degrees Celsius. Constant. 48, seven days. Yeah. Um. 48 degrees. So, it's... I'd, I'd faint in that. I'll yeah, you could. You could. It's um, often compared to the Mad Max films for the vehicles people yeah. take there because it's a very peculiar festival. You need to people like, dress yeah. up. Um, people who have been to Glastonbury try... I, I can imagine people going there, being in their cars with the uh, air conditioning on max and still sweating. Yeah. Um, people who have been to Glastonbury... Arcadia, which is a huge spider which has flame throwers coming mm-hmm. out of it. Someone will have a miniature version of that there. And it would be placed there. Or, or just for the whole seven days. And the music side of it is there's not normally bands there. It's just normally people who would take instruments. So like an open mic night. But yeah. Bigger so style. say yeah. you're one of your bands. You could just go there. I mean, maybe steampunk up your guitars a bit and <laughs> look, look, look a bit more rugged <laughs> and perform because there's no stage you just, people just be walking around and um in death valley like just out in death valley middle of nowhere chances of survival zero well no they're quite high they've got from what i've read online it's very very hot on the first aid they've got um a few helicopters there every year, uh, ready. Yeah. You do have like, someone dies. <laughs> you have like uh, helicopters just above with buckets of water ready to. Be yeah. People. <laughs> um, but the strange thing is, in this 120 degree heat, in the last day they decide to ger- burn a giant wicker man yeah. that they've built over the seven days, which. It'd burn without needing like it to be oh, lit. Yeah, to get hate. a chop piece of glass out. <laughs> um, but the best thing is, and this is why I really like it, it's completely self efficient. So, I remember that. Like, there's no power there, no signal, obviously, because I mean, even being in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing out there to give you signal, mm-hmm. and it's just. There's nothing there. That road you was talking about, is it on the edge of that? Or do people have to actually make their um, own? There are quite a, quite a lot of dirt roads out there, but people will take RVs out there. Um, Which are like, like massive like, camper vans. Huge camper vans. The Americans spend ridiculous amounts of money on them. Um, Lots of celebs go, don't they, now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's people there who take who build... Vehicles, especially for it. I mean, there's been people have taken snowmobiles out there because it works the same on snow as it does on sand. Right. And they'll be riding around on a snowmobile. There'll be dune buggies out there, and just so many different kinds of things compared to Mad Max. Like, if you've ever seen any of Mad Max films, the cars they have in that, where they've been modified mm. to be able to. You might as well take monster trucks out there. Yeah. People probably have before taken monster trucks out there. But completely self sufficient. Oh. It's. <laughs> it's like most festivals where there's quite a lot of <laughs> narcotics. Yeah, <laughs> you're rambling. I am rambling. 
It's, it's good though, we learn a lot about music festivals because they are a big part of the music industry and people make a lot of money by going, obviously by going to see them. Yeah. The companies make a lot of money. So I think we'll touch on this again for yep. the for part four and the final part of music festivals next week. Should we choose two random letters or are you going to choose? Uh, I'll do them later. Okay. I'll do them um, next, next week. week. Yeah, next week we've got quite a big one. But for, I think for the final part, we've been looking forward to... Uh, the uh, more dirty side of Shakespeare's ah, plays. Uh, right, so I've chosen who I am, okay. I think. So there's, I think, you know, in Twelfth Night, mm -hmm. um, so there's this, um, I don't know if you know Twelfth Night, but there's this thing where, um, do you know Twelfth Night? I, I haven't no. seen it. All right, no. so there's there's this thing where there, there's um, a plan, a plot, where they... Uh, there's this really obnoxious man and they um, right. tease him and they get him to wear yellow tights and garters because he's just being obnoxious and, and tell him that his um, his female boss um, loves him and um, he, which she doesn't. So that's a lion then? Yes, yeah. and, and they get him to go in... Um, so I'm guessing you... Say so, your character is the female boss. No, no, the woman who who organises all of this is called Maria. Right, and that would be me. Wants him quite mischievous, quite. Yes, yeah, she's the one who is. Uh, yeah, she's a um, Olivia's gentlewoman. I mean, I've got to say, Charlie, that that question is absolutely ten out of ten. It's a genius it's question. A who really, do you think you are? Yeah, in, in out of yes, so I think mm. yes, I think I'm probably a. Um, uh, a mischievous uh, character in Shakespeare. I mean, now that you've told us um, yours, I think I should probably Who say mine. Who are you? Um, Romeo and Juliet. Mm. So Romeo has a best friend called M Mercutio. Oh yeah, okay. I'd probably say Mercutio because yeah. obviously I don't. Know if, I don't know if all of you have seen it. Maybe. Um, Read it. Read it. Seen it. <laughs> uh, so. So you're the best friend. Yeah, Mercutio gets shot by. Uh, ben Not shot, darling. Stabbed. Stabbed. <laughs> yeah, gets well st shot in the film. Yeah. Stabbed in the play by uh, I can't remember, Ben Volio or something. Ben Volio. Ben and then Romeo shoots Ben Volio or stabs yeah. Ben Volio. Yeah. I've no, it's um. Too many movies. And then Tybalt is the one who kills. Is it Tybalt? Oh Mercutio. yeah, sorry, Tybalt. Yeah. It's, it's, Tybalt. It's, it's not, and then Tybalt shoots. Yeah. The yeah. Show and then. Yeah. Romeo shoots Tybalt. Because, um, a plague or both yeah. your houses? Mercutio's, Mercutio is the one who's always a little bit over the top. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, Bathy. Yeah, I thoroughly recommend... He kind of had it coming for him. <laughs> I thoroughly recommend watching Romeo and Juliet because it's absolutely brilliant. Mm. What about you, Charlie? Who would you... Um, I don't know. I mean... I mean, it's a very difficult There's question. quite a lot of things I could compare to. I mean, I could slightly compare to Puck. Or can slightly compare to Hamlet, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Are you a bit Hamlety? Mm, I'm good looking. <laughs> Do, where does it say that Hamlet's good looking? <laughs> no, um, I've, got, I've, got to, I've got to look up Hamlet now. See what we look. Probably like. compare myself mostly to Puck because I am quite mischievous. Mm, really I mean, got, to be fair, I haven't really got the facial hair. Have maybe I? if you grow a moustache. Doesn't it say <laughs> that about? About no, I'd probably compare myself mostly to Puck because I am quite mischievous and do like having a laugh. By if you if you look up what it says about um, Puck, I am. No, it's come up with a Puck from hockey. <laughs> yes. Type of midsummer night's dream. So it says Puck. Puck talks about. He looks like a. He's a wood cupid. nymph, I believe. But no, but he, yeah, he, he, he actually talks about Puck's description. There's a bit, a bit where Puck describes himself, um, he's, uh, and says, "I am that same Puck." Isn't he a that Robin? He's a wood nymph, isn't he? So uh, it's, a mis it's a mis mysterical character. Shall, shall I read it? Yeah. To you. Try and zoom in on this. So Puck says, "Thou speakst all, all right." I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest her Oberon and make him smile when I a fat and been fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly fowl, and some time lurk I in a gospel's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab, 
and when she drinks against her lips, I bob. And on her withered dew lap, pour the ale, the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. Some time for three foot stall mistake of me, then slip I from her burn down topple she. And Taylor cries and falls into a cough, and then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and waxen in their mit- mirth and knees and swear, a merrier hour was never wasted there. Okay, so this is a really good thing. It's a really good introduction to the bit that you were going to be talking about. So it's a bit of an introduction into the um, ruder bit of Shakespeare. Yeah. So this is talking about how Shakespeare um, does lots of very physical jokes about mm. boobies. So sexual references. Yeah, yeah. And and bottom <laughs> bits. But, um, yeah, so he does... Shakespeare... Um, talks about you know willies and boobs to be able to um, play something to the audience. Well, yeah, to be able to to uh, um, talk to be able to talk to the um, to, to the groundlings. Um, there were politics that he had to um, get round and, and talk to the n- nobles, but to be able to talk to the mm. people who who'd given pennies, he had to be able to. Um, uh, um, you know, to, to give the, the base the jokes to. So, in 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 terms of uh, how um, how sexual it gets, how how bad does it get? Just to I'm not going to give really bad jokes. Um, let me find my really. So there's there's a really great book which I can recommend for you to go out and get, which is called Filthy Shakespeare, right. if you want to. Um, but there there. Are, Within Shakespeare, there's lots of rudeness. There is just lots of rudeness. It's just, you know, you just have to go and read it. Um, it's all there. Yeah. Um, so you recommend this to people listening? <laughs> no, I recommend that if you read it, it's there. Um, Obviously, uh, some of the stuff in there is a bit... Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I, I rec- you know. Uh, so, for example... Um, hang on a second. Let me just find something. It's up to you to be able for you to be able to uh, read it. Yeah. Um, uh, so hang on a second. Okay. Let me just find you something that I'm going. I'm only going to do one thing. After, after Miss Van Hoven's uh, read this, I, I think we're going to end on. I think we're going to end the p- podcast on a funny note. So. Can you read the screen, Charlie? Are you able to read that stuff? I can't take that. <laughs> really? How about now? That's from Hamlet, is it? No, that's from... That's from M- uh, Macbeth. Macbeth. We're, we're each going to read two lines of this. Because there's three. There's more than... Yeah, it, it should work out. Wait, well, three lines? Back to me for the last bit. Yeah, that works. Uh, Shakespeare was um, quite big for his quotes as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm. I'm trying to think of one that I've seen before. I mean, um, I know more quotes from more modern pieces. That's the problem. Um, well, what is it you're looking for, me? Should we, should we, uh, should we have a go at, at this then? Yeah, you do that. So okay. There's, there's three of us to finish off the okay. the, the podcast. Yeah. We're gonna. Well, there's three of us. So okay. There are three witches in Macbeth. Okay. There's just enough here for all of us to have a go. So okay. We're each gonna read two lines. Okay. So I'll start off. Okay. Go on. Then you. Yes. Okay. And then, Charlie, can you all see yeah. the screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay, let's give it a go. If we got it wrong, we could, we could try again. Okay. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a fenny snake, in the cauldron, boil and bake. I've newt, toe of frog, will of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and howler's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth, boil and bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Cool it with a baboon's blood, and then the charm is firm and good. Yay! Sorry, Done I it. couldn't see the last bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That's probably my favourite part of any Shakespeare play. Yay! Right, love it. So next week is our final podcast. Yeah, we'll have a uh, Miss Miss uh, Miss Anne Anna Braveway on for the Christmas special, and hopefully Mr Fullerton, as he sadly couldn't make it this week. So. Yay! So um, yeah, well, thank Christmas you very music. Much. That's then. okay. That's my my pleasure. I'm sure they won't copyright or some Christmas music from the amount that's being played at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> not. Yeah, we'll, we'll be back then. Thank you very much for listening. Have a, have a great Christmas if you don't catch next week's podcast. Take it easy.